I'm Mark Halperin. And I'm John Heilman. And with all due respect to Donald Trump's claim that everything in his campaign is hunky-dory, there's someone he might want to call. Brian Priebus is not happy right now. Incredibly upset. Furious with Trump. Absolutely furious. Quote, apoplectic. Quote, apoplectic. Quote, apoplectic. Quote, apoplectic. 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 Well, you know, a lot of things bother me. Apocalypse now, or at least apoplexy now, day sports fans, with three months still left to unfold before November 8th. This day in presidential politics began with frenzied reports of profound angst and feverish agita in the Republican Party, with its leaders, strategists, and donors all ringing the five alarm fire bell over the possibility that Donald Trump has shifted from being the chaos candidate to the kamikaze candidate, with his campaign apparently spiraling out of control. Republican National Committee Chairman Reince Priebus in particular was purportedly furious with his party's nominee over his Washington Post interview yesterday, which Trump pointedly declined to endorse House Speaker Paul Ryan and John McCain, the Arizona senator, in their primary contest this month. Even some of Trump's closest allies admitted today a dramatic change of course was now imperative. Trump is still behaving like as though it was the primaries and there were 17 candidates. He has not made the transition to being the, the potential president of the United States, which is a much tougher league. People are going to watch you every single day. They're going to take everything they can out of context. And he's not yet performing at the level that you need to. I, I, I'm frankly reminded uh, Joe Montana went through a, a stretch during his career when he kept throwing interceptions. And for about half a season, it looked like he, like he wasn't Joe Montana anymore. And then he figured out what he was doing, and he changed. Gingrich also told the Washington Post, quote, he, meaning Trump, cannot win the presidency operating the way he is now. She, meaning Hillary Clinton, can't be bad enough to elect him if he is determined to make this many mistakes. Compounding the widespread panic over Trump's behavior are various media reports suggesting disarray and rebellion within Trump's team. Is that true, Paul Manafort? First of all, the candidate is in control of his campaign. That's number one. And I'm in control of doing the things that he wants me to do in the campaign. Uh, the turmoil, this is another Clinton narrative that's been put out there. The campaign is in very good shape. Uh, you know, we are organized. We are moving forward. And the Clinton machine may not like it, but we're prepared for the fight. There have been reports in some media outlets that some of Trump's allies would like to stage an intervention with the candidate with the help of his family. But Bloomberg Politics has learned that two of Trump's children, Don Jr. and Eric, left this morning for a hunting trip in the Yukon. On the bright side for Trump, none of the Republicans he singled out yesterday have lashed out at him in a way that would escalate the Republican threat level. And Trump's running mate, Mike Pence, did a soothing interview with Fox News this afternoon, both embracing Trump and endorsing Speaker Ryan. Bloomberg Politics has also learned that Trump has plans to make a major economic policy address in Detroit on Monday. So, Mark, after all of the self-inflicted damage of the past several days leading up to and culminating with the Washington Post interview yesterday, at this hour, <laughs> is Trump any closer to getting his campaign back on track? Given what happened 24 hours ago, today could have been a lot worse. Uh, Trump has something to talk about with this new report about Iran and the United States sending money to Iran. Trump was more focused in his event this afternoon. You didn't see John McCain, who's got a history of popping off, or Paul Ryan or Kelly Ayotte. The three people Trump went after yesterday come back at him in a way, a newsmaking way. Speaker Gingrich, I think, has probably been bad for Trump today, despite being an ally. But right. make no mistake, while it could be worse, below the radar, below the scenes, there is panic in the Republican Party because they know they can't abandon him yet, but they also know that he is headed currently in a direction they do not want to follow. It is the case that, in the worst case scenario, today, any number of people, including Speaker Ryan, could have withdrawn their endorsements of Donald Trump and renounced him today. So in that sense, 100% right, could have been a worse day. I feel like right now the Republican Party is on tenter hooks, and there are a lot of conversations taking place at a little, every quarter of the party about what are we going to do? Because no one believes a good day means anything anymore for Donald Trump. Because you could be, you know, we still have some hours before we all go to bed tonight. Donald Trump could go off the rails again later tonight or tomorrow. Right, he has pushed the party right to the edge, it seems to me, of widespread defections. We're going to talk about this a little more later, but of widespread defections of people abandoning him in droves. They're right at the edge. 
didn't happen today. That's good for Donald Trump. But boy, it's a very, very tenuous situation right now for him. And the hilarity, because we've seen this before, when people say, well, in the next few days, we need to fix this. No, it needs to be fixed now. And the fact that his two sons are away right. uh, and not particularly reachable right. is a real problem. Right. Because they are amongst the only people on planet Earth who can persuade him to do something calibrated and different. I think they're the only people on planet Earth. I mean, I don't have... Well, I, his son-in-law and his daughter also. I consider them part of his family. Yeah. I just mean, I'm saying I think family members. I don't think that any of these outside strategists, I don't think Paul Manafort has, at this point, any real ability to change Trump's behavior. All right, there is someone who's got that potential. As we said, Mike Pence tried to defuse tensions today with his interview on Fox News in the middle of the day. Listen to the vice presidential nominee thread the needle between his loyalty to Donald Trump and showing the rest of his anxious party that the ship can be righted. The enthusiasm out there across this country for Donald Trump's message and his vision uh, is just overwhelming. I think what Donald Trump said is he's not there yet. These are two men that are building a good relationship. And uh, I'm very confident uh, after Donald Trump's elected president and Paul Ryan's uh, re-elected to Congress and as Speaker of the House, these two men are going to do great things to restore this country at home and abroad. I strongly support Paul Ryan, strongly endorse his re-election. He's a longtime friend. He's a strong conservative leader. I believe we need Paul Ryan in leadership in the Congress of the United States. I talked to Donald Trump this morning about my support for um, Paul Ryan, our longtime friendship. He strongly encouraged me to endorse Paul Ryan in next Tuesday's primary. Yesterday, Pence met in Arizona with John McCain and while he was on a campaign trip. That's the same day, of course, that Trump suggested to the Washington Post that McCain has not been good enough to veterans. So, John, what is your sense of Pence's role in everything here now? You know, if you're on a if you're on a little plane and you're going through turbulence and it's like rattling around, there's a guy who's grabs the grabbing the stick. It's like the the, the co-pilots reached over and grabbed the stick away from the from the from the faltering pilot who like has passed out in his seat and is trying to like stabilize the plane. He's making the best of a horrible situation for him, undoubtedly, and he's doing it, I think, actually quite well, given the extremists in which he's operating. But people looking at this are going to think it's pretty weird that, that there's this division on so many issues, increasingly, where Mike Pence is having to be in a different place than Donald Trump. Welcome to Trump world, where yeah. things can be weird. I mean, below the radar, you talk about all the conversations below the radar that are problematic. Pence is calming down donors, Republican members of Congress, people in the media. More than anyone else. More than anyone else. Yep. And he's doing it, you know, people are going to say he's cashiered his credibility, et cetera. But he's doing it by largely being true to himself. And he can say Trump sent him out and, and urged him to endorse Ryan. But it's clear that Pence is trying to keep the peace within the party and to get to a place where Trump can be back winning news cycles. So, I mean, you think about the hilarity if the running mate were Newt Gingrich or Chris oh Christie. <laughs> The kerosene that they would be oh, pouring on things. Horrible, yeah. Whereas Pence is, I mean, he's out there, not in the spotlight necessarily, except for this Fox interview, but he is calming people down and giving the ticket a chance to try to regain its footing. Gingrich and, and Christie are pouring gasoline even yeah, without being in the ticket. Been, yeah. <laughs> you know, like I said, he's making the best of a bad situation, but as, you, we, as we both know, you know, if Trump wants to drive this bus off the cliff in the end, Pence will not be able to keep that bus from going off the cliff. And so in the end, it all comes back to Donald Trump. Again, man, God bless Mike, Mike, uh, Mike Pence just because of a situation I would not want to be in. Not at all. All right. Last night, after we went off the air, the New York Times reported that Meg Whitman, the Hewlett Packard honcho and prominent GOP donor, became the latest member of the Billionaires Against Trump movement, joining the ranks of Republicans who plan to vote for Hillary Clinton in November and not her own party's nominee. That is still a pretty small club of Republicans, but there is growing speculation that more defections are in the offing. Meanwhile, relatively late Trump endorser, Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, says that he will not appear with his party's standard bearer on Friday when Trump rolls into Green Bay. So, Mark, clearly there are going to be more Republicans backing Clinton in the coming weeks. We know that's true. But at what point does there get to be a critical mass that actually has an impact on this race? I think underrated in this is some people at the state level. Yes, the national people like a Meg Whitman are going to get a fair amount of attention. And I think there'll be more news making people. There may even be more members of Congress. But it is people at the state level that I think can really impact the race. Respected state officials, the Clinton campaign will be sure to aggressively highlight them. They have a huge operation to promote news within battleground states. I think I think I think we're nowhere near a tipping point, but we may get to one if Trump has a bad first debate. I don't think there'll be a huge tipping point before then. Those things all matter. I'll tell you what, I, I, I would bet a lot of money 
that between now and November, we are going to see an event orchestrated by the Clinton campaign that is going to have a dozen or more Republican, diehard Republican military people, former military people, yeah, oh, sure. general level oh, of lieutenant, major, like a bunch of them who are going to stand up on stage and not just endorse her and not just say they're going to vote for her, but stand up and say, this man here's, cannot have his finger on the nuclear button. Here's, and that will matter. Here's the dirty little secret about why Paul Ryan has done what he's done and most Republicans have stayed with Trump. 70% of the base, maybe higher if you're in a gerrymandered yeah. district, they want Trump. Yeah. You abandon Trump, there is no formula for winning a general election right. if 70% of the base is angry at you. And nothing like that will affect and, the military people, though. Yeah, but that's right. But in terms of Republican office holders, it's going to be hard to pry anybody away, which is why this is so interesting. When we come back, we're going to talk about that cargo of cash that the Obama administration secretly sent to Iran. But first, these words from our sponsors. back time to follow the money the wall street journal as we said reported today that the obama administration secretly sent 400 million dollars to iran in january the same day four detained americans were freed in tehran senior u.s officials say there's no link between that dough and the prisoner exchange they say the timing was purely coincidental and the cash was part of a 1.7 billion dollar financial settlement between the u.s and iran after a failed arms deal almost four years ago republicans though have pounced on this including trump the republican national committee john mccain many more. Trump was unrelenting in his criticism, led his speech today in Daytona Beach on this matter. John, can Republicans use this effectively as an issue? Republicans make, can make an effective issue about the Iran deal, which is a controversial deal and divides a lot of people in the country. A lot of people think it's a bad deal. On the matter of just of substance, this $400 million, we, we knew that we were going to be sending them a whole bunch of money, right? And, and this is part of that big chunk of money. So you don't like the deal? Criticize the deal. They could probably make some some headway on that. But in particular, this $400 million, is this going to matter to anybody on Election Day? I don't think so. Fires up the base whenever they talk about sending, sure. whenever Trump or any Republican talks about sending money Answer. to Iran. And, and, ju and just sending money. Yeah. Just sending money. I know, money. I know. It fires them up. So I don't know that this is going to cut across undecided voters or independents or anything. But I think with the base, this is, a, this is a great talking point for them for the duration. And it allows them, it gives them a way into criticizing the Iran deal in general, right? I mean, just because the Iran deal is a hot point point for the base. It opens the door to that argument and gives them a hook on it. Right. I said the deal was four years ago. It was four decades ago. Yes, so this four is decades a, This ago. is a yes. very old issue. And clearly the Iranians wanted to try to tie up all the loose ends at once. The timing looks ridiculous. And of course, this is the way these deals work. But I will say, foreign policy in general, critiquing Obama, Clinton foreign policy is something Trump and Pence are going to need to do a lot better if they're going to have foreign policy as a big talking point because Trump has scrambled so many of these issues. 100%. Uh, the other money story that Team Trump is trying to capitalize on today are the new fundraising numbers that show his campaign raised $80 million in the month of July, most of it from low-dollar donors, ending the month with a trove of $37 million cash on hand in his campaign. That closes much of his fundraising gap with Hillary Clinton, who pulled in $90 million last month and has about $58 million on hand. So, Mark, uh, do we, these numbers suggest to you that we should be thinking anew about whether the Trump campaign can compete in terms of dollars with the Clinton juggernaut. Very encouraging numbers because of the low dollar thing. And, and Trump now can get in a rhythm of getting people, as Bernie Sanders did, as Barack Obama did, to people to keep giving over and over. And it solves, at least partially, the fear of Republicans having being badly outspent. On the other hand, they still need to figure out how they're going to spend the money they bring in right. effectively. Right. And yet, yes, you know, I'll give you credit. You know, you said all along you thought Trump would be a good online fundraiser, that he had a good brand for it. That's yeah. turned out right now, it seems like they're able to capitalize on that. You know. If they can't keep up with the Clinton campaign in terms of money, all of their other problems are just going to be compounded. This at least suggests there's a possibility they can do it. We know the Clinton campaign is going to raise a ton yeah. of money between now and November. But what Trump knows, and I give him credit for this, I've talked to him about it, is low dollar donors get invested yes. in the campaign. They Correct. not only keep giving, totally. but they volunteer. They well, turn you out don't to max vote. out. You don't max out. Yeah, no, but they're also activists. Right. You know, yes, once they're yes, invested, sure. they turn out to vote. They get their friends to turn out. It's, it's, an, Obama, army. it's the great it's Obama building lesson. An army, it's and the they, Obama lesson. They had a very successful month. Let's see how they keep it up in August, September. But the other Obama lesson is that you get those people invested. And then you have to have a structure and infrastructure in the battleground states to go out and deploy them yeah. and get them to do stuff. They don't have that stuff as, yet. As I said, the raising's half of it, then they got to figure out if they're going to spend it well. All right, up next, check in with some reporters, reporters out on the trail on Trump and Clinton right after this.
We're joined now by two women who have been following both presidential candidates around this country for quite a long time. NBC's Katie Turr joins us from down the street at Trump Tower, and MSNBC political correspondent Casey Hunt comes to us live from a Clinton event in Commerce City, Colorado. Casey, Katie, thank you for joining us. Katie, you have been on the Republican Party in disarray, apocalypse, craziness mode all day today. Um, we keep hearing. Can we say like all year? No, all, all year. Okay, all like year. Fair, fair enough. Um, how? We, Mark and I were just saying we thought this day, compared to how it could have gone, has not gone that badly for the Trump campaign. What's your sense of the threat level right now uh, over there at Trump Tower and in the GOP more broadly? Well, he did uh, go and, and have a campaign rally uh, in Jackson, uh, not in Jacksonville, or he's Jacksonville tonight, uh, but in Florida today, and he did not come out and, and trash Paul Ryan. So that is a positive note for the campaign. Um, I can tell you that behind the scenes, they're trying to tamp down on this idea that there's any campaign infighting. They're saying Donald Trump has always been the outsider candidate, the anti-establishment candidate. Why would he support Paul Ryan if Paul Ryan is not supporting him? Why would he support John McCain if John McCain isn't supporting him? Why would that come as a surprise? So this idea that there's infighting in the campaign, uh, they're, they're trying to, say, to pump the brakes on that. And I can tell you that, at least from the sources that I've been speaking to, uh, the infighting idea is not as large uh, as it has been during past controversies, say when there were more Corey Lewandowski folks on the campaign. Uh, but there are aides that are telling Donald Trump and people that are close to Donald Trump telling him that it's time to, to enough with the controversies, that it's time to move on, it's time to focus on his message, and it's time to start acting a little bit more presidential so he can win this race. Right now, if he continues with these controversies, winning the race is going to become harder and harder. Again, guys, we're in the middle of New York City and there's a siren, so I apologize. I'm going to give it back to you. Okay. Um, Casey, we know that part of the messaging from President Obama, from the Clinton campaign, is Donald Trump's not normal. Don't vote for him. He's not a normal candidate. How yeah. did they view the endorsements of people like Med Whitman to try to get people to see Hillary Clinton in a different light? Um, I would call it the normalization of voting for Hillary, right? They're trying to make it so that neighbors, Republicans, longtime Republicans in places like Ohio feel like voting for Hillary Clinton is a perfectly normal thing to do, even though they may have been members of the Republican Party for many, many years. And that's part of why you're seeing this kind of split messaging. In any other year, we would have heard Democrats messaging on this idea every time Donald Trump said something, oh, Mitch McConnell is just as bad as Donald Trump. You're not seeing that. You're seeing a distinct separation. They're trying trying to put Trump off on this island by himself as very separate and different uh, with this goal in mind. Uh, Casey, I was told, I was intrigued when I was told today that you'd been somewhere naughty in Colorado, and then I found out it was the Naughty Tie Company, um, which uh, level, lowered my intrigue level. I put that in there just for you, John. Yeah. Um, tell us about what, that, what that, this whole event out there is designed to drive. What's the message here in terms of Donald Trump's ties and outsourcing and all the rest? Yeah, that's the Naughty Tie Company, K-N-O-T-T-Y. Uh, they make American-made neckties, which, of course, Hillary Clinton's campaign would also like you to remember that Donald Trump's neckties are not made in America. And this is all aimed at one group. Pollsters call them non-college whites. That's what this election is turning out to be about. Yes, we are in Colorado, which is a much more diverse state. Yes, it's been a swing state in the past. But right now, the Clinton campaign doesn't have a dedicated ad buy here. They're not up on the air here. The Priorities USA, the Super PAC, they're not up on the air in Virginia. They are up on the air in Pennsylvania, and that should tell you a lot about what this is focused on. She's here talking about things that are made in America. Tomorrow she's going to be in Las Vegas talking about apprenticeship programs. It seems like it's down in the weeds, but that's really about people who don't have college degrees. And they feel like if they can make inroads between now and November with those people, they can ensure that they're able to win this election. I will say the one number, we obviously talked a ton about the top line poll numbers out of that CNN poll the other day that show her with this post-convention bounce. One number they're paying very close attention to, that she was up two points on the economy. And he w had been up on her 11 points in that category. They feel like if they can nail that part of this down, then they're going to be able to coast in a way that they wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Katie, Trump normally does not brook anyone on his team contradicting him in public. And yet he's allowing Mike Pence to go out. Pence says he was encouraged to go out and say, I support Paul Ryan. Why does Pence get a special place that he's allowed to do stuff like that? 
Uh, sources say that Donald Trump called Governor Pence earlier this morning and said, uh, hey, if you want to endorse Paul Ryan and, and that's how you feel, go ahead. I know you've been longtime friends. I know you've been longtime colleagues. Uh, and that is fine. Why he's allowing Governor Pence to do it, um, I'm not entirely sure. Maybe it's because it puts Pence into a, uh, a pretty hairy situation uh, given his ties to Washington. It also allows him uh, to sort of have his cake and eat it, too. He can be uh, the tough guy on the campaign, and Governor Pence can be the good cop, uh, trying to get the Republican establishment more in line uh, or more trusting of Donald Trump's uh, campaign at the moment. Uh, but so far, guys, the party is really having the biggest problem with Donald Trump right now. Uh, we're told that the the not endorsing Paul Ryan, not endorsing John McCain, uh, is basically the last straw. There's been controversy after controversy. Uh, the con uh, attacks being just the latest. Also, the, the not giving the, the veteran his purple heart back and said pinning it on himself and fighting with the baby at the rally, even though that was a joke, they just see these things as unnecessary. I was speaking to a swing state GOP operative, an influential operative, who said that Donald Trump has a psychological problem, that a psychiatrist would d diagnose him with a personality disorder, that right now the conversations behind the scenes aren't when we are going to pull the cord, but at what point do we have to pull the cord because Donald Trump has become so unmoored? And what does that look like? Does that mean that the RNC starts directing funds away from Donald Trump's campaign and to Senate races? Do they start directing staff away from the campaign and to Senate races? Uh, and how much support do they lend to Donald Trump? There is a feeling that if they completely cut him loose and he tanks in the polls, that they're basically going to be giving out their majorities in both the House and the Senate, and that is something that they don't want to think about. Casey, um, they're, they're, Donald Trump's trying to make hay today with this Iran ransom uh, story. Does the Clinton campaign think that there is any uh, risk or danger to them there politically? Look, I think that they're very much aware of it. This is something that they're treading carefully around. Clearly, she's very tied in uh, to this. But I do think that they feel like it's yet another example of a story that's getting overshadowed by what's going on with the Trump campaign. I mean, they've been pretty lucky the course of the last couple of days. She had that misstep in her Fox News Sunday interview where she talked about Comey saying uh, that she was truthful in all of her statements about her emails. That was something that got buried underneath uh, everything that's gone on with the Khan family, and I think that there are some similarities uh, here with that, and we'll see if she gets asked about it. She's doing a couple local interviews. I'd be interested to know how she responds to it herself. Uh, we, of course, haven't had a chance to put it to her directly today. All right. Uh, Casey Hunt, KHR, it's always an extraordinarily large pleasure to have you on the show, so thanks for being here. We'll come back soon. When we come back even sooner, anxious Republicans and the political Xanax they're starting to pop. We'll talk to two former party chairmen right after this. Which concerns you more? That he'd lose the general if he were the nominee or how he'd do as president? Losing the election. <laughs> what we're facing is a choice between Hillary and... and so so what you're I'll saying you is vote for the least of two evils. Do you, you know couldn't. for sure Trump would be a better president than Hillary Clinton? No, but it's a risk that I'm willing to, to take. If we get off into splitting our party, we can't put it back together. Humpty Dumpty won't come back together. That was some of our conversation with party leaders from the Republican side, including Mike Duncan from last March that aired on The Circus, our Showtime documentary series produced in conjunction with Bloomberg Politics. Mr. Duncan was chair of the party from 2007 to 2009. He joins us now from our Washington bureau. But before we get to him, another former RNC chairman, former Montana governor, Mark Roscoe joins us by phone from Big Sky Country, where he's from. Governor Roscoe, thanks for joining us. I just want to start off by asking, you had hoped, you wrote in the Washington Post, that the Republican convention would not somehow make Donald Trump the nominee. Now that he's the nominee, what do you think the Republican Party's posture should be towards him? Well, I can, um, uh, the party, of course, is an association of people that changes constantly. So when you refer to the party, um, it really is a kind of uh, an anomaly because there's no identifiable group you're referring to. We move in and out virtually on a daily basis. 
But my, my great hope is, I mean, when I took a look at the race and tried to think for myself, um, naturally I want to be a team member. I want to support a team loyally. But there are some transcendent principles that um, also come along with running for the highest office in the land, and I think the most powerful person in the world occupying that office has to meet those um, principal tests and uh, program tests. Frankly, um, his program or his, his uh, policy uh, proposals just simply don't match up with the platform of the Republican Party or conservative principles. And secondly, and most importantly, there's no exhibition of any kind of characteristics right. that go into decision making at a presidential level that suggest to you that even though you may disagree that there's a sound basis in fact and in good sense and in an honest judgment and i find none of those things present and available with mr trump and so, as a consequence I, my hope was they would do something different at the convention but today what i can say for myself is that i cannot and will not support uh, mr trump for president of the united states all right so does that mean mr chairman you plan to vote for hillary clinton no, it doesn't. Um, you know, to be very honest with you, to bear my soul, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I do know that I'm not going to be casting a ballot for the presently existing Republican nominee. And you think that it's that your your basic? What's your message to Republicans who are wrestling with the same dilemma right now? Should they just be free to vote their conscience, whether that means supporting Trump, not supporting Trump, or in fact going all the way and supporting Hillary Clinton? I think they should do the first right thing, and the first right thing, in my view, is to make a judgment about the quality and character, the content of the character of the candidate. And if it doesn't match up with what you think are transcendent values that a president, regardless of party, has to embrace, then you should um, act accordingly and not cast your ballot. I mean, you know, Winston Churchill once uh, talked about feeding an alligator, hoping you were the last one the alligator ate. I'm not accusing people of being appeasers. But what I am saying is that there's a transcendent set of values throughout our history that we subscribe to above party. And um, that's what I believe that I'm focused on, and that's what I would urge uh, my fellow Republicans to focus upon as well. Okay, Chairman Raska, thank you so much for joining us by phone. Joining us now by camera from our Washington Bureau, uh, Mike Duncan, also former chairman of the party. Mr. Chairman, what have the events of the last week done, if anything, to impact your view of Donald Trump as your party's nominee? Well, obviously we're not off to the start that we could have had. We got a bump out of the convention, which is one of the things I talked to you the last time that was important to do, and, and we've squandered that. Uh, the kickoff has occurred. It's game time. We're within that 100-day period of time. We're 96, 97 days out. Uh, it's time for us to be on offense again, and we're playing defense. We're letting the other team move the ball down, down the field, and we've had the opportunity to take that ball back, but we've had self-inflicted wounds during that period of time. So I'm disappointed with where we are. Frankly, I'm pleased that uh, the Olympics are coming up because I think you're going to see uh, you're going to see an opportunity for retooling. I think you're going to see more fundraising going on. I think you're going to see more consolidation of the Republican vote. So the next three weeks is going to give us that opportunity that we need to get into that sprint that occurs after Memorial, uh, or, I'm mean, sorry, after Labor Day. Mr. Chairman, do you think it's acceptable for your party's nominee to attack a Gold Star family? No, I think the Gold Star family should be off limits. My grandmother was a Gold Star mother. I understand that. It, it, I, it's something I understand in my family. I resent uh, politicians using families and, and slain uh, military leaders as pawns in their game. I think we don't need to be talking about that. I think it was a huge mistake for Trump to talk about the Gold Star family. How do you feel about the notion of your party's nominee refusing to endorse the highest ranking Republican in the land? Well, there are always disagreements. So sometimes you don't see those disagreements among party leaders. I think we'll come together. Uh, I was pleased to see that uh, Governor Pence came out with his endorsement today. And I think Donald Trump encouraged him to do that. I think at the end of the day, Donald Trump will uh, will support uh, uh, the nominee, uh, the speaker, and I think they'll work together. It's just part of that pushing and shoving that is not often on the stage. It's usually behind the scenes. Mr. Chairman, you sound pretty optimistic given the events of the last week. I'm wondering what you would say to Republicans who, many of whom are in a panic over the way Donald Trump has performed. 
Well, don't let the dog days of August get you down. Uh, we're only down about four and a half points after they had a technically superior convention and they were able to get a big bump out of that. There's a lot that can happen in the next 97 days. We've got a candidate uh, who understands what's going on in America right now. And what's going on is people want change. Donald Trump represents that change for the American people. Mr. Chairman, you're talking about politics right now and about whether Donald Trump can win and, the, and whatever political damage. A lot of people in your party think that what's been exposed here is a fundamental character flaw and a set of temperamental flaws that like make Donald Trump, and I'm talking about what Republicans think right now, make him unfit to be president of the United States. Do you not share any of those views? I, I believe that we have the most inexperienced presidential candidate in my lifetime and perhaps in history, and he's making mistakes that an experienced candidate would not make. I think that's what you're seeing going on right now. When I look at the two candidates and I weigh the, the philosophy and the morals of Hillary Clinton, uh, I, I'm going to go with Donald Trump because I know who Donald Trump's going to appoint to the Supreme Court, Again, the, which is really important to Mr. me philosophically. Chairman, you, you don't have any concerns about his temperament or character related to his fitness to serve as President of the United States? Obviously, I have concerns. I'm concerned about who he's going to appoint to be around him and making those uh, decisions uh, in the cabinets, who's going to be advising him on a daily basis. I think all this is very important uh, to, the, to the temperament and the tone of a new administration. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mike Duncan, former chairman of the party, also thanks Chairman Roscoe, who joined us in this segment as well. When we come back, we're going to talk to one of Hillary Clinton's top economic advisors. And if you're watching the program in Washington, you can also listen to us on the radio radio in the nation's capital, Bloomberg 99.1 FM. We'll be right back. Joining us now is Gene Sperling, an economic advisor for the Clinton campaign and former national economic advisor to Presidents Clinton and Obama. Gene, thanks for coming on the show. We, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the, the campaign momentarily and, and the outsourcing push that the campaign's putting on right now. But I want to ask you a little bit about President Obama yesterday, who made a really full-throated argument for why TPP is still in America's interests. Um, what's your view about that? Are you, uh, are, are you now in disagreement with your president and, uh, on this issue? You know, it's always hard when you're the child and mom and dad disagree. Uh, I think President Clinton, I mean, excuse me, President Obama, everything he does, uh, he is directed towards helping workers, and that's what he believes. But on this issue, I think that uh, Hillary Clinton is in the right place, which is that we have to put our full focus as a party progressives on uniting behind clear job creating measures like infrastructure, like investing in manufacturers, like uh, uh, ensuring that uh, we don't have a tax code that encourages outsourcing and inversions. And I, I, you know, she sees real challenges with this, and I think she wants to put TPP in the, in the rear view mirror and be focusing. So, listen, these these are two great people who I'm honored to have worked with. They disagree. Uh, I think trade is always a very, very difficult issue. Uh, but uh, as we say, I'm with her. Gene, do does Secretary Clinton think globalization is good for American workers? I think what she thinks is that one of the great challenges of our time is to ensure that globalization and technology are being shaped by our policies in a way that strengthens the middle class as opposed to hollow out the middle class. And I think that she feels that we have not, you know, she feels that President Obama came into office wanting to deal with those issues, but had to focus so much on saving the country from a possible Great Depression. I think she has the ability to come in now with a focus that has a single focus, which is, yes, globalization, technology, automation, these are realities, but they don't have to be things that are having the kind of impact on creating inequality, hurting middle-class wages that they have. And that's why she's going to have a comprehensive plan on infrastructure, on manufacturing, on higher education, both for people who want four-year colleges and apprenticeships and other skills or coding uh, 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 credentials. Uh, that's why she's going to have a comprehensive strategy. But, the, but I think if you talk to her, you'd say that she thinks the single focus we have to have is to make sure these forces, these powerful forces, are being shaped in a way where they strengthen the great American middle class, as opposed to hollowing it out and having weaker wage growth and more in, uh, income inequality. And unfortunately, that is what we've seen uh, over the last uh, 15, 16 years. Gene, you had a pretty important role in shaping President Clinton's economic agenda and, and his theory of the case. 
I could, I could, if I needed to, describe for you what Bill Clinton thought about the new economy and about the economy in about 10 or 15 seconds. Putting people first would be the first words out of my mouth, a phrase I know you're familiar with. Do that for Hillary Clinton right now. Don't spend more than 30 seconds, but tell me, what's her theory of the case on the global economy and where we are right now? The theory of the case is that we need to focus all of our tax trade, manufacturing and skill policies on the bottom line of whether they are creating good high wage jobs in the United States. We can't assume that just because something might be good for the profit bottom line of a company or an individual, it's necessarily what's best for middle class workers and people striving to be in the middle class. And that's the lens she's going to put all of her policies through. What are the things that are not just good for GDP or not just good for the productivity of one company, what are the things that are good for creating the strong middle class jobs, strengthening the middle class, and providing greater security in a changing economy? And that includes things like health care, pensions, paid family leave, things that are critical to whether a family feels they're raising their children with dignity and security. Gene, does Secretary Clinton think the United States should have more and can't have more manufacturing jobs, or the United States should move towards a more of a service economy? She believes that we can and we should have more manufacturing jobs. And she has a Make It in America plan. And the understanding is that manufacturing is light like research and development. It has benefits to the economy. But what we have to do is have a modern manufacturing plan that realizes the strength is not just in the big manufacturing factories, but in the supply chain. What we saw in saving the automobile company was it wasn't just saving the big companies. It was saving all the small businesses and suppliers. That creates a web of strength that makes people want to stay in the United States, not leave, and makes more people want to come and, 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 and locate in the United States because of the benefits, the connections to suppliers and the university. And one area you're going to hear a lot from her is about making our tax code more patriotic. Right now, there's lots of advantage in international tax arbitrage, moving jobs overseas, moving profits overseas. You're going to see her wanting to shape the tax code to reward the people that are investing in manufacturing our coal communities or hard hit communities or the type of things that are creating uh, good middle class paying jobs in the United States. That will not be a side point. That will be her, the single lens, her single focus by which she looks at all of her economic policies. All right. Jean Sperling speaking with extraordinary and unusual brevity and concision here on With All Due Respect. We love having you on. Um, and thanks very much. Uh, coming up, we'll communicate with two campaign communications experts after this. Welcome back. Joined now by two people who they say in Rhode Island are wicked smat. Matt Bennett, senior VP for the think tank Third Way, former uh, staffer for Bill Clinton and for Wesley Clark's presidential campaign in 2004 and with us from Dallas Republican communications strategist former press secretary for George W. Bush's presidential campaign Mindy Tucker Fletcher Mindy Matt thank you for coming Mindy you first what have you learned about Donald Trump in the last week that you didn't know before if anything <laughs> um, or do you mean how much worse has it gotten maybe sure. you can answer uh, it that way I don't like. think I don't think anybody's learned anything different. I think we've seen a lot more of the same. Um, we might have learned a few things at convention that made us a little more interested or showed a different side of him, but he came straight out of convention, the same old Donald Trump, just pulling the same kind of things, saying the same kind of things, and um, it's disappointing. Yeah, and we should say you're you're in never Trump land. You're, you're not going to vote I for am. Donald Trump. Okay, um, that's true. Do, does Donald Trump is he doing anything now? Despite all this horrible stuff that's happening to the campaign, is he doing anything now that makes you think, oh, maybe maybe this guy's formidable? Well, not in the last couple of days. Obviously, the last week has been like if we had gotten into a room with a bunch of Democrats and drawn up on a whiteboard what we want Trump to do, this would pretty much be it. Uh, but. <laughs> That said, anyone who thinks this race is over is crazy. Uh, there's no question that he carries broad appeal, that, that things can change, there can be big surprises, and nobody should take anything for granted. Matt, if, uh, you, you run a group called Third Way. Yes. Um, if I ran a group called Third Way and I attended the Democratic convention in Philadelphia last week, I would have <laughs> taken cyanide by the end of the week. It was like the least Third Way convention I've ever seen on the Democratic side. Hillary Clinton pulled way to the left on a ton of issues. Were you not, are you not worried about where she now is on policy? You know, not exactly. Uh, a couple of things. One is, 
For one thing, the party has changed dramatically in national security. Uh, you guys have pointed it out, you know, flags, USA, generals, toughness, internationalism is pretty new to my party and I, we're very encouraged by that. The party is totally unified on social issues, so there's no concern there. And on the economy, I mean, you talk to Jean about this, um, she's gone a little farther left than we hope, but, but you know, look, Democrats, they campaign as protectionists. Bill Clinton did, Barack Obama did. You govern slightly differently. When she gets in there, uh, she's gonna face almost certainly a Republican Congress. She'll be the first Democrat to take office without controlling both houses of Congress since Grover Cleveland. So you're basically, you're basically saying you think she's lying about TPP? No, she's I do not be, say She's gonna come into office and be a free trader? Let me be clear. Uh, I do not think she's lying. I think she's completely honest. But I think the demands of being president mean, particularly if you're an inter internationalist the way she is, that it's very difficult to be a, a, a protectionist as president. Mindy, if you were sitting uh, in Paul Ryan's office right now and you had got the uh, you got the the word of what Donald Trump did yesterday in the Washington Post, and you understood all the political dilemmas that Ryan is facing with his members and the base, et cetera, what would you advise him to do? He is in a tough spot. Um, you know, that, that contingent in Congress and in any state legislature that is that sort of Trump, angry, I'm not taking it anymore, no one hears me, um, group is really hard to deal with. I think the primary objective right now for all Republicans, especially the never Trumpers, needs to be the Senate and the House and the down ballot races. Nobody wants to make a choice between these two candidates. You don't like Trump, you're certainly not gonna vote for Hillary. I think all of us need to take everything we've got and put it into these down ballot races. If I were Paul Ryan, I'd be out campaigning for everybody I could campaign for. Um, I'd be working to make sure that when Hillary likely right. gets there, we have a front. But we have a you, front mounted to deal with what she's gonna do. But, but your view is that he should maintain his endorsement of Donald Trump all the way to the end, no matter what? You know, I, I don't think, I don't understand why he endorsed him in the first place, other than I think he's worried that if Hillary wins, someone's gonna come back and blame him because there's that always goes on inside the party. Um, I think at this point, he needs to not do the whole back and forth, I'm endorsing you, I'm not, that childish game that looks like they're fighting over the ball in the playground. I think he needs to focus on his job, do what he's gotta do, not focus on the, the sort of noise each day from the Trump campaign, get, get into these races and do what he needs to do to make sure the Republican Congress is there no matter what happens. Hey Matt, you got a question for Mindy you'd like to ask? I mean, sure. Uh, <laughs> don't you think it is incumbent on not only the leadership, but the rank and file in Congress, if you see a guy who is manifestly unfit to be commander in chief, isn't it their job to say so? I mean, the first duty of an elected official, a federal elected official, is to protect the country. How can you say you're protecting the country if this guy is totally unfit to be president? I agree. I think that's why there's so many Republicans who are saying, not a chance, I'm not voting for him. I think the really important thing for everyone to understand in both parties in this election is why Trump is where he is. I, I've been here in Dallas with my family this week. I have a full understanding of the people who are yeah. angry. They feel like they haven't been listened to. They feel like Washington hasn't done their job. And Donald Trump's kind of the only person that even halfway spoke to them. And I think we need to understand that if we're gonna move forward and we're gonna elect people in this country. Um, it's fine to say he's not, he's not fit to be commander in chief. He's not qualified to be president. We all agree with that. But I think we need to understand it if we're gonna stay in politics and try to get other good people elected. Some people looked at what President Obama said a couple days ago, not as actually encouraging Republicans to switch, but to basically make it impossible for them to switch, to keep them all uh, married up and, and, and wedded to Donald Trump. How do you see that? You know, <clears throat> it's an interesting theory. I don't think he was gaming it quite that dramatically. I think he had just come out of a meeting with a foreign leader. Uh, every foreign leader he talks to for the past six months has said, oh my God, what is going on with Donald Trump? And he has been confronted, the same thing we have over the past week, of this just unbelievable set of, of um, mistakes that Trump has made. And I think he was speaking his mind. I think he was saying the same thing I was saying, which is if he is unfit to be commander in chief, it is incumbent on Republicans to admit it and to say it and to protect the country and, and uh, try to keep him out of the Oval Office. Okay, Matt Bennett, thanks for joining us in studio. Mindy Tucker Fletcher, it's nice to see you off the California beaches and back with real people in Texas so you understand what's actually going on in America. I think that's good for all of us. Anti-California bias yeah. here showing through. But Thank you okay. both. We'll be right back.
So we got this big new Fox News poll, their first big poll after the conventions has Hillary Clinton up 49-39 among registered voters, a thousand big sample. What do you think about that? I think it's going to be interesting to see how Donald Trump handles it because he's not been pleased with news organizations whose polls he doesn't like, but right. he seems in general to like Fox News. She is killing it with the Obama coalition. He is underperforming Mitt Romney, and you got 12% of Republicans in this poll supporting Hillary Clinton. And she's winning big even though people don't trust her still. You can read more about of our great reporting about the unrest within the Republican Party right now on our website, BloombergPolitics.com. Coming up on Bloomberg West, Emily Chang talks to a pair of venture capitalists. Until tomorrow, from Mark and me, we say to you, sayonara.